Hello and welcome back to the third realm. I usually don't buy anything unless it's at least in very good cosmetic condition and boxed. But I made an exception for this model. I placed a low bid on an auction site which to my surprise was enough to win the auction. So let's have a look at what I got for the money. First things first, what is it? This is a Merklin 3518, a model produced between 1988 and 1992. It represents a Bavarian S36 classed as BR18.4 by the Deutsche Reichsbahn. The prototype was used in the late 1920s and throughout the 30s to pull a flagship train of the Deutsche Reichsbahn called the Rheingold, a model of which was also released by Merklin in 1988 under reference Fordable to 8. The locomotive was available in three versions, all cosmetically identical but equipped with different motorizations. The 3318, a traditional analog version. This version, the 3518, also analog but fitted with what Merklin called a five-star propulsion system. And finally, the 3618, a digital version. I already own the 3318 and the 4228 Rheingold set, which you might remember from a few videos I published in the past. I have put a few links at the top of your screen for your reference if you're interested. As mentioned earlier, this was a cheap buy, about £55, including fees and all the various taxes, plus shipping. Here are a few pictures from the auctions listing, which would normally have made me move on to something else. Plenty of dirt, paint defects, maybe even a bit of discoloration here and there, and one of the brake shoes is missing. The seller, who honestly pointed out all the defects in his description, also mentioned the model is functional. But all in all, not much to go for at first sight. So why on earth did I bid for this? Well, it contains a few parts I might have a use for. We should have a functional 5-star propulsion system. This comprises of a driver board and a 5-pole motor. The pictures are not clear and the description doesn't mention it, but I think the model might have been fitted with a smoke generator. A 5-star propulsion kit would cost me about £45 plus shipping. The driver board on its own will set you back about €40 Euros, and the motor armature usually sells for about €15 to €20. Euros. A used smoke generator is usually about 10 euros and you'd have to pay about 20 euros for a new one. The remaining parts have a value too. The driving wheels, for example, are about 15 to 20 euros per axle and even the cardboard box is about 10 euros in a fair state. So, worst case scenario, I bought parts I could use at less than the cost of sourcing them individually with the option of selling on what I do not need. So £55 should not be a bad deal in theory. Now let's have a look at how bad the model actually is. We have the original box with a few storage marks, but nothing worth mentioning. It's normal, the box is 40 years old nearly. Let me open it. The blister pack is not yellowed, that's good. Let me flip the box to get the pack and the logo out. We sadly do not have any paperwork and one of the hinges of the blister pack is broken, which is a relatively frequent occurrence on this type of packaging. Let's take the model out now. Oh dear, pretty much as expected. I will put it on a presentation rail regardless and we'll have a closer look. 
Well, the seller didn't lie. It is in a bit of a sorry state. But it doesn't look as bad as it did on the auction pictures, in my opinion. Yes, it's a bit dirty, but not as much as it seemed to be. This might have to do with the lighting, or perhaps the seller played with the exposure settings before uploading the pictures. All the little bits and pieces applied to the body are there, and nothing is broken apart from the uh, brake shoe. One of the pipes is a bit bent, but that can be straightened. It's only a bit of wire. Basically, it is all there. Now, the flaws. The red pinstriping is obviously damaged, as expected. There are also spots where the paint has rubbed off, particularly the inscriptions on the side of the cab, or even the sides of the cab, and the cylinders. Looking at the top of the boiler, the chimney decal might be a bit discolored, but that's a common issue with these models. And a smoke generator was indeed fitted. If it works, this is good news. A look on the uh, chassis shows the logo has been well used. The pickup shoe is completely worn and will need replacing, and everything else will need a good clean. So, time for a quick checkpoint. Cosmetically, the defects are as described, with the addition of a smoke generator, and overall the model is in better shape than expected. Now, does it work? Let's move to the layout. There we are. Let me rail the model. Now, moment of truth. Let's give it a bit of power. And we have motion. Excellent. Let's try the other direction. That works too. And the lights are operational too. Front and back. Excellent. And you can see the locomotive progressively accelerates. So it looks like the five-star proportional system is working, at least as far as the acceleration is concerned. Now, uh, talking about five-star proportion, I need to have a quick peek inside to check that everything is as it should be. Let me get a screwdriver. There we go. The body screw for this model is located under a cap in one of the domes. The cap just pulls off, no tools needed. I loosen the screw and the body simply lifts off. It all looks original. We have the motor at the back, which should be a five-pole motor, and a driver board in the center of the chassis. Combined, these two uh, elements form the 5-star propulsion system. Why 5-star? Uh, well, it's a marketing term meant to promote five core features of the system. We have the 5-pole motor, which allows maximum torque at all speed, whatever the load, apparently. We have electronic load regulation, which compensates for variations in load and driving conditions. It helps the locomotive in maintaining a relatively constant speed, for example, while going up or down inclines or ramps. You can set a maximum speed, which the locomotive will not exceed, whatever the throttle position on the transformer. And then we have better slow driving characteristics in general. Uh, that's more due to the 5-pole motor than the load regulation. But the load regulation allows for an acceleration delay feature. The delay can be set, uh, in which case the locomotive will only progressively accelerate until it reaches the speed set at the throttle. And then we have anti-wheel slip, which is a side effect of the electronic load regulation, and this improves the traction. The driver board is basically just a beefed-up electronic reverser with added circuitry.
The max speed and acceleration delay are set using two onboard potentiometers. So I'm going to turn the potentiometers to check if the behavior of the loco changes. Well, there the story is not so good. The behavior is quite erratic. After trying to set the potentiometers to different positions, I couldn't get to a predictable behavior. Uh, I might be doing something wrong here, but the basics seem to be there. We've seen that the locomotive accelerated progressively when we first tested it. So I'd need to check this bit later. Uh, for now, I will put the body back on to check the smoke situation. Let me put a drop of smoke fluid in the generator. I just need to find the hole. There we go. Let's go. And we have a puff of smoke too. Excellent. So it's time for another quick checkpoint. The chassis is functional, the wheels are quartered properly, nothing wobbles. The motor runs, the current is getting to the right places. We have a gradual acceleration, so the driver board should be functional and the smoke unit is operational. Based on this, I think that all this chassis needs in first instance is a Thoru service. Once that's done, I might need to have a look at the electronics, but I'm not expecting any major problem there. Famous last words. We'll soon find out. Let's have a closer look at the body. The paint damage is really a shame. Uh, the dirt or grime is only superficial and easily removed with a cotton bud. Uh, we have paint missing on the cab roof and its sides. It looks like the damage was done by servicing the loco on a rough surface. You know, removing the body and simply laying it on the table and perhaps dragging it back and forth. If we look further up the side of the body, the right paint is damaged, that we already knew. But it's really bizarre the way it's been uh, peeling off. But on the good side, the paint on the running board has not suffered as much by the looks of it. I think the damage could be mended. I need to give the body a good wash first to get a clearer picture before deciding on what to do next. So I first remove some of the details like one of the wind deflectors on the damaged side and a pump, then I proceeded with washing the body and tender. For this I used lukewarm mild soapy water, a soft brush and cloth to remove as much of the dirt and grime as possible. And then I let everything dry completely before returning to the layout. Let me get everything out of the box now. Tender. There we go. And here's the body. I'll put the box aside. So if we look at the body first, there are a few soap residues and already a few finger marks here and there, but it's much cleaner. And if we look at the running board, it's actually not too bad at all, as there are only minor paint defects there. The main issue is really the pinstripe, where we are down to bare metal in places. If we look on the other side, uh, there we only have minute defects and I even think the imperfections in the pinstripe are original. Looking at the cab, some of the inscriptions have rubbed off a bit, but most are still legible. The explanation is simple here. The previous owner or owners must have held the locomotive by the sides of the cab when handling it. Over time, the paint slowly started rubbing off. And if we look at the front, the number we could barely see in the overview or on the auctions listing picture is clearer to see now that the grime has been removed. Okay, let's look at the tender. 
it is all there, the coal is nice and clean now, and the inscriptions are undamaged, so no problem on that side. Well, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. I think it's worth trying to fix it, and I am very tempted to give it a go, even if this means facing my nemesis. So, I ordered some supplies, and whilst I was waiting, I worked on the chassis. That took me hours, much more than I anticipated, and quite a few cotton buds, as you can see. Let's go over what I needed to do briefly. I first serviced the motor, a good opportunity to check the armature. It was indeed a five-pole motor. It is one of these, in its original bag here, with the five arms and the green weights. Here's the reference number of the part, if you're interested. So, that bit was very grimy, but is fine now. I cleaned all the wheels on both chassis and tender. I changed the pickup shoe. I cleaned the valve gear, which was covered in oil and grease residues. That shouldn't have been so. I tidied up the wiring a bit and fitted some red tape to hold things in place. There was a piece of black tape there originally. Then there was the driver board. Let me zoom in. I have had to deal with the potentiometers which were not working properly. They were oxidized so I had to drench them in contact cleaner and rotate them numerous times to try and clean them by distributing the contact cleaner on the surface. And I had to repeat the exercise several times until they finally sprung back to life. That took really ages. But it is all running smoothly now. So I'll put the chassis to the side until I have taken care of the body. So we're a few days later and my supplies have arrived and it's time to get the pen brushes out. You'd have gathered I am not looking forward to this bit. I have no clue about what to do, and this type of activity fills me with anxiety, as most of my previous attempts at painting never produced a good result. After inspecting the body, my intention was to remove the pinstripe ahead of the inscription near the cab, mask the loco, and prime the surface with a light grey primer, apply a coat of red, then touch up the running board with a bit of black. I started taking some of the red paint off, at which point a layer of black paint was revealed. So I decided to change my approach and remove paint only in the damaged pinstripe areas, then cover these with black before applying the red paint. I think this will help in achieving a better match with the original colour. I looked up the rice ban colours and bought Fiery Red, it's a RAL 3000 for the pinstripe, and Satin Black RAL 9005 for the base coat, running board and other body touch-ups. So I proceeded to sand down the damaged pinstripe areas first. It's down to bare metal. Then, after wiping the areas clean with a bit of alcohol, I applied the black base coat and all the touch-ups on the running board and cab, and I let everything dry. I then masked everything I needed to mask around the pinstripe and it was time for the red paint. Fingers crossed. A few minutes of shaky hands later I was done. I set the body aside to dry, praying that the red paint 
didn't bleed under the masking tape. So we're now a day after and while removing the masking tape I had a little accident. Some of the original paint lifted from an area I hadn't touched so I had to touch this one up too and let it dry. And the result is that the body wouldn't win a beauty contest but I think the color matches well and it already looks much tidier. I could possibly improve things a bit but I risk ruining things based on past experience. So that'll do for now as far as I'm concerned. I return to the layout to reassemble the logo now. And here's the final result and I must say I am a bit surprised. It's tidy, defects are covered and my crappy paintbrush skills don't show too much. Not bad at all if I may say so myself. It is a shame about the cab lettering. I think decals could fix this but I don't know if any are available for this logo. I might google it up in the future. But right now I'd say the locomotive is a keeper as it is. Let's do a quick money check now. I spent uh, £5.20 on paint. I had the rest of the supplies already. If I had had to buy everything again I would have spent probably £30 on branded products. So the total cost for me uh, in this case was £60 plus shipping costs. I think it's time to see how the locomotive looks in front of the train it was made for. Let's move to the layout. I got the beautiful Rheingold set out. It's made completely out of metal so it's a very heavy thing. The loco is coupled and the smoke generator is filled up. We'll start with the party tricks. I have set up the locomotive with a 25% acceleration delay and a 50% max speed. The throttle is set at 140 on the transformer. I'll give the loco a green signal now. And we can see the train progressively accelerates. Now if we look at the loco over a succession of curves it should maintain its speed. It's nice and smooth on radius 2. Now radius 1, same thing. And again on the other side. Excellent. Now the inclines. There the regulation should try and compensate. We are a tiny bit slower on the climb but it's an easy one at throttle setting 140. And again the loco maintains its speed on the level section. Now the other ramp, there the motor should receive less power but the loco still accelerates a bit. We can see why Merklin started the description of this feature in its marketing material with the words to a large extent. Yet it is definitely slower than a conventional loco would be. So it's not digital but it's not bad. Right, I think we have brought a neglected locomotive back to a usable state now and I am relatively pleased with the result. I shall leave you now with a quick few impressions of the locomotive on the layout.